Welcome to our Journey of a Lifetime, Lesson 15. This lesson we're going to be looking at the book of Job. And we're going to start over here with a quick review of our Old Testament library. We've uh, covered the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then we went through the 12 books of history. We Last lesson we finished with Esther, the last of the books of history. And this lesson we'll be starting with the first of the five books of Wisdom, and that's where we'll start out naming those first five books. The books of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Now these are called the books of poetry because the majority of the book is a poem. Um, it's surprising perhaps to a lot of people that a third of the Bible is a poem. Now a lot of times we think about poetry in America, we think of it as rhyming, but not all poetry has to rhyme. All the poetry in its broadest definition just means it's in contrast to prose. We'll talk about that a little bit more in our next lesson. We talk about Psalms, but prose is just when it's written in a normal uh, sort of sentence structure in the same way that, way that we would speak, while poetry is formed with lines that are abbreviated for different reasons. And sometimes it's to rhyme. Sometimes it's to contrast, and sometimes it's to do all kinds of different things, but it's just a, a, a line where things are divided in lines in ways differently than we would speak. So each of these books, these five books, all are formed primarily in poetry. As a matter of fact, most of the book of Job, except for the first chapter, a bit of the second chapter, and part of the end, is all poetry. Forty books, excuse me, forty chapters of poetry. And... Uh, as a historical note, uh, scholars tell us we don't know the exact time that the book of Job was written or exactly who the author was, but we do know, we, excuse me, I should say that uh, scholars do estimate they probably lived in the time of Abraham and Sarah. So as we talked about, as we're going through the books of wisdom and also the books of the prophets, we'll remember that uh, even though the books are uh, coming in this order in the library, they don't flow chronologically. So this book of Job probably was in the time of Genesis, um, the same time as Abraham and Sarah. And the question that's considered in this book is, as I have it written here, why do bad things happen to good people? Or as it's written in the text, why do good people suffer? Because within a short period of time, Job is going to lose his wealth. He's going to lose most of his family. Um, he's going to lose everything of value to him in this world. And the question is, why, if he's such a good person, did these things happen to him? You can see there at the bottom of page 65, there's the book is divided into three parts. Two, uh, the beginning part and the ending part are very short. And most of the middle part is the conversations, or should say the arguments that Job had with his three or four friends, if you count the last. Okay, let's look at the first uh, number one at the bottom of page 65. It begins in the first verses, which I'm going to read. Kind of sets the scene. Um, this scene begins with an earthly scene. We talk about in uh, verses 1 through 5. It sets the tone. This talks about Job, that he's an upright man. He's a righteous man. It talks about the fact that he has seven sons, three daughters, very blessed, very prosperous. He has thousands of sheep and camels and oxen, donkeys and servants. And it says that he was one of the greatest men in the east. And uh, then it talks about how he also used to do uh, his offerings and sacrifices to God. And now every way he was considered a righteous man. And then in chapter, excuse me, verse 6, we see a shift from this earthly scene to a heavenly scene. And in this heavenly scene, it's as it always is when we talk about heavenly, inst uh, heavenly uh, visions or he heavenly pictures, it's a sort of a mysterious thing that we have a difficulty understanding. But it basically says this, that there was a day when the angels were coming into the presence of God and Satan came along as well. And then God asked Satan a question. He said, have you considered my servant Job? That Job is a righteous man. And then we see the first of the accusations that Satan gives against Job. And we're going to see it here at the top of page 66. I'll read it and you can see the suggested answer up there. And uh, verse 9 in chapter 1, Satan says this, Does Job fear God for nothing? Nothing. 
have you not made a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But if you put pull, excuse me, if you put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, that is take away all that he has, surely he will curse you to your face. So in very strong language, Satan says, the only reason Job is following you is because you give him good things. And if you take away those good things, Job will not honor or worship you, God. So then God allows him, allows him to uh, lose all of his animals. They're confiscated or taken by some uh, tribes that are around. Then we see there's a lightning storm or some sort of fire from heaven that comes down and kills the sheep. And then the most sad, the saddest chapter probably of the book comes, excuse me, verses, comes in verses 18 and 19 where it says that uh, one of the servants came and told him that same day that all these other tragedies were happening, that there was a, his, all, his, uh, all of his children, three daughters, seven sons, were gathered in the house of the oldest son, and a great wind came and knocked down the walls of the house, and it collapsed, and all ten of Job's children were killed. So a great wind caused the house to fall, and they're killed. Yet in the midst of all this, um, it's amazing and humbling to see Job's response. In verse 21, he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. And it says in verse 22, the last verse of chapter 1, Through all this, Job did not sin nor did he blame God. So then Satan comes back before the Lord, and we have the same sort of scene, and Satan says, well, if you took away his health, then he would certainly curse you. So then we see the next thing that God allowed to do, the next blank that you have, the middle of page 56. God allows Satan to hurt Job's body. But Satan cannot take his life. So Satan strikes him with boils. It says these uh, terrible, painful boils all the way from the, the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. He's covered in boils. And then his wife, as she sees him, and you have to remem remember how difficult and tragic the circumstances have been for his wife. She comes to him and she says in verse 9 of chapter 2, Can you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But, you know, I'm going to be a little bit easy on the wife, and I think we can see a, a sort of a little bit redemptive phrase as Job responds to her in verse 10. He says, he says to her in verse 10, You are speaking like one of those foolish women. Uh, excuse me. You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept diversity? And so the point is I want to try to take it easy on his wife a little bit as we should all take it easy on people who go through these horrible tragedies often we're overcome with grief and circumstances we'll say things that we don't really mean in the moment and I think what we see is Job is telling his wife hey you're you're talking like one of those faithless women those foolish women and you're not one of those women but we have to be careful anytime we come upon someone who's having difficulty in tragedy. And, uh, and if they say something that's harsh or difficult to hear, we need to just be sensitive and to just let them speak and let the wind just kind of carry that phrase away, knowing that later on, as they've had uh, a time of healing, that uh, the Lord will be able to work in their heart. So, as we look down at the bottom of page 66 in your book, um, we see... That Job's suffering after he becomes his wife has left him now, going probably back to her family. We don't know where. He's sitting sick with these boils. He's lost all of his material possessions. He's lost all of his ten uh, children that he loved so dearly. And it says that he just wanted to die. It would be better if he had never been born. And now this is interesting. He's not the only hero of the Old Testament who says this. You remember Moses also said that he wished God that he had never been born, that he would die. Also Elijah. So we have these three, three of the pillars seen as the greatest men in the Old Testament. Each one of them experienced circumstances where they despaired so much that they contemplated it would be better for them not to be alive. 
So the point is this, you know, whenever we're going through kind of difficult circumstances or someone we know is and may go through a deep, dark period like that, it's good to remember that even these heroes of the faith despair to, despair to this sort of bitter, um, uh, this sort of bitter depths. And yet, God still built them back up. And we can remember, as it says here, what it says in Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Now, the truth of that statement is this. That promise is only for those who have responded in faith in Jesus Christ. It's not for everyone. Tragedies for people who are separated from God and not forgiven for God are tragedies. There's no good that will come out of them unless they should turn to God. That is a promise only for God's children. Now let's look at the top of page 67. Um, it says there, I'm going to read that paragraph at the top of page 67. It says, when we talk with God and try to lead good Christian lives, Satan will do everything in his power to break that fellowship. It may be in the form of tragedy, financial reverses, or disease. However, no matter how bad things seem, God has a purpose for everything, and He is in complete control. So even when we sense this question, we're going to get to the answer, or not necessarily an answer, but how to process that question in just a moment. As we move to the second part, which begins in chapters 4. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you'll look through your Bible, um, you'll notice actually in chapter 3, your Bible will change. The first two chapters, it's written in sort of what we call prose or normal sentence structure, like we would speak. And then we see in chapter 3, this poetic form, this line form begins in chapter 3. It's going to continue all the way to almost the end of the book. And in chapter 4, we see the arrival of four of his friends. Uh, they have names Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. And uh, later on, a young man named Elihu is going to come. Now, here is the summary of their teaching. And by the way, a lot of the things that they said had truth in it, had good theology, had maybe 90% good, but it had this poison and one of the poisons was the tone. This sort of have a person who's in such difficulty and tragedy, and yet the tone they're coming coming with is very harsh. It's very uh, con condemning, and they always say this. This is the sort of the main point of all of their arguments. The reason this bad thing has happened to you is because of some sin that you have committed, some sins that you committed, and that was really the key, the flaw in their logic. You'll remember Jesus when there was a, a man who had been <clears throat> crippled since birth. They said, whose sin was it? Is it his, some sin he did or his parents' sin? And Jesus said it was neither. But it was so that God, God would be glorified. And so these three men argue that Job's suffering is because of his sin. It's the middle of page 67. The fourth friend, Elihu, he shows up and then he adds a new insight to the debate. He gives a similar but a little bit of a twist, a little bit more correct in his explanation. This is one of the things he said. He said that God does not unfairly test his children, and he will speak to us in tragedy if we will listen. And now this is true. So it's still a mystery. Still don't know why, and it's certainly not because of some sin that he had committed. Now some bad things that happen, of course, are the natural consequences of sin, but not every one of them is. Not every bad thing that happens to us is simply because we've done something. Some of them have become some heavenly reasons that we don't understand at all. But here's what we do know. Um, is uh, God's going to show up in this context. So after these three friends have spoken, and then the fourth one comes and speaks. And by the way, with the first three friends, Job really debated and argued. But after this fourth man, Elihu, comes and gives his case... We don't know if Job doesn't respond because he maybe agrees with him or because he just is out of energy and doesn't want to debate. But we do know that at the end of this Elihu speaking, that someone else comes to the debate. And it is God himself. And as you see the picture in the bottom of page 67 of that whirlwind, that God himself comes in the whirlwind. And I'm going to read the first few lines of uh, chapter 38, verses 1 through 3. 
when Jesus, excuse me, when God arrived in this whirlwind, this is what he said. It says this, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you will instruct me. Uh, and uh, of course, that's just being cynical. He's saying, who is this? If you think you're so smart, you think you're so capable, then stand up. I'm about to question you. And then God is going to start him asking him question after question. Here's an example in verse 4. He says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? He's going to ask him question after question. Where were you when I enclosed the doors or set the depths of the seas? Where were you? And he's going to go and list all these things. And these are all questions. And here's the answer that God is getting, giving to him. There are many questions that are beyond our capacity to understand the answer. And I call, put that here that there's are heavenly answers that we as human beings can never get to the bottom of. And this is one of those questions. Why do bad things happen to good people we really don't know the full answer because we never even in the life of Job in 42 chapters never do get the answer to why these things happen other than to simply trust in the character of God. And so God goes on chapter after chapter 38 goes through 39 still questioning him into 40 still uh, Giving, telling God lots of things, and then God continues to question him, and through 41, and then all the way to 42. And then in chapter 42, we'll see that finally, after all this, three, four, five chapters of questioning, and, and in each of these questions, Job realizes he has no response for any of these questions. They're just above his ability and his capacity to give an explanation. And then we see in uh, chapter 42, verse 6, what is his response? Excuse me, let me go back. I missed that one. His response, it says this, he was ashamed of himself, and he repents in dust and ashes. And um, I'll read the first thing that he said about the Lord in, in uh, verse 2 of chapter 42. Uh, Job says this, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I retract. In other words, I will stop trying to question God's purpose and meaning in it and simply trust in who God is. And then we see that God restores him. And what does he restore him with? We see that he restores him as twice as much as he had before. Now, if you look down at verse uh, 10, though, there's an interesting thing that happens just before he uh, has these things restored. God rebukes the three friends, or all, the three of the friends, and remains silent on the fourth. But then it says in verse 10 that the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. And then it goes through and lists all the animals. And if you go back to the beginning of the book, the amount of things he had at the end of the, the book are doubled. And then it says something very interesting, I think, that we can get some insight from in verse 13. It says that he had seven sons and three daughters. Now, if you remember back to the beginning of the book, that's how many. So it looks like with, when you first glance, wait, he didn't get double the amount of children. He got the same amount of children. But there's really a profound statement in that. The truth is he did have twice as many children. What we see here is a value of understanding that those 10 children who died tragically in the beginning of the story were still in existence. Uh, Job still had those children. children. Certainly they were in heaven. So when he had 10 more children on the earth, now he did indeed have twice as many children. So the human value that stamped, even though those children uh, tragically died, their value, their being was still in place. It's just that they were with the Lord. And then we see finally uh, 
that even his lifespan was doubled from 70 to 140 years. And uh, there are many lessons and many people have read this book for comfort. And of course, one of the most profound things about this book to think about, if it was written in the time of Abraham, then it was written over 4,000, nearly 5,000 years ago. And to think about that someone, we often think people have lived that long, that long of a time ago, must have been very simple people. But the language that is used, the poetry, poetic form that is used, the philosophical statements and all this, whoever wrote this book thousands of years ago was a genius. I mean, this is an amazing piece of literature. Of course, God inspired that person and worked through them. But it just lets us know and to try to humble us. Sometimes we think we in this modern age, we have it all figured out. And these people back then were just kind of simple people. But the reality is, this is the most profound description that we have that discusses this question and gives us the answer. And the answer is this, that in this life, there are many tragedies. We will never know why they happened. But we do know that there is a good God and because of his loving character and his just character that in the end, um, he is going to make all things work for good. The tragic and also the good things that happen to us in our life. And of course, the greatest example of that we have in the New Testament is Jesus Christ himself. He wasn't treated fairly. He was deceived about, or excuse me, lied about, and he was falsely killed. And yet God used all those evil, sinful things, tragic things that happened even to his son, and used all those things he intended and he used for the good, not just of Jesus, but for the good of us. I reminded of Joseph, who at the end of his book, all of his trials, his brothers come before him. He said, brothers, don't be afraid for what you intended for evil. God has intended for good that I would save this whole nation and indeed save my family as well. So somehow in this mysterious, sovereign way of God, even the worst tragedies, which are unfair, may be brought upon us by Satan himself. God can still use even those things for good. And then we also have to remember, as it says here in 1 Peter 3, 17, sometimes we do not even see the answer in this life. And I think that's the story, the testimony of those 10 kids in the first verses. That's uh, uh, similar to that passage in 1 Peter, that there are some people who pass away, who do not receive that restoration in this life, that they have to wait till they get to the next life in order to, re to receive that full restoration. So the final passage there, the final paragraph says, finally this book teaches us we can have peace in the midst of the storms of life, not because we're anticipating reward for our suffering, but because the Lord has a purpose for everything that happens in our lives. And that is the message of old Job.